of all things chapter one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. of all things by robert c benchley chapter one the social life of the newt it is not generally known that the newt although one of the smallest of our north american animals has an extremely happy home life. It is just one of those facts which never get brooded about. I first became interested in the social phenomena of newt life early in the spring of 1913, shortly after I had finished my researches in sexual differentiation among amoeba. Since that time I have practically lived among newts, jotting down observations, making lantern slides, watching them in their work and in their play, and you may rest assured that the little rogues have their play, as who does not, until, from much lying in a research posture on my stomach, over the enclosure in which they were confined, I found myself developing what I feared might be rudimentary creepers. And so, late this autumn, I stood erect and walked into my house, where I immediately set about the compilation of the notes I had made. So much for the non-technical introduction. The remainder of this article bids fair to be fairly scientific. In studying the more intimate phases of newt life, one is chiefly impressed with the methods by means of which the males force their attentions upon the females, with matrimony as an object. For the newt is, after all, only a newt, and has his weaknesses just as any of the rest of us. And I, for one, would not have it different. There is little enough fun in the world as it is. The peculiar thing about a newt's courtship is its restraint. It is carried on, at all times, with a minimum distance of fifty paces, newt measure, between the male and the female. Some of the bolder males may now and then attempt to overstep the bounds of good sportsmanship and crowd in to forty-five paces, but such tactics are frowned upon by the rules committee. To the eye of an uninitiated observer, the pair might be dancing a few of the more open figures of the minuet. The means employed by the males to draw the attention and win the affection of those of the opposite sex, females, are varied and extremely strategic until the valuable researches by Strudelhoff in 1887, in his Entwickelungs Mechanik, no one had been able to ascertain just what it was that the male newt did to make the female see anything in him worth throwing herself away on. It had been observed that the most personally unattractive newt could advance to within fifty paces of a female of his acquaintance and, by some coup de bring her to a point where she would, in no uncertain terms, indicate her willingness to go through with the marriage ceremony at an early date. It was Strudelhoff who discovered, after watching several thousand courting newts under a magnifying glass, questionable taste on his part, without doubt, but all is fair in pathological love, that the male, during the courting season, the season opens on the 10th of March and extends through the following February, leaving about ten days for general overhauling and redecorating, gives forth a strange phosphorescent glow from the center of his highly colored dorsal crest, somewhat similar in effect to the flash of a diamond scarf pin in a red necktie. This glow, according to Strudelhoff, so fascinates the female with its air of elegance and indication of wealth that she immediately falls a victim to its lure. But the little creature, true to her sex instinct, does not at once give evidence that her morale has been shattered. She affects a coyness and lack of interest by hitching herself sideways along the bottom of the aquarium, with her head turned over her right shoulder away from the swain. A trained ear might even detect her whistling in an indifferent manner. The male, in the meantime, is flashing his gleamer frantically two blocks away and is performing all sorts of attractive feats calculated to bring the lady newt to terms. 
I have seen a male, in the stress of his handicapped courtship, stand on his forefeet, gesticulating in amorous fashion with his hind feet in the air. Franz Ingelhalt, in his Uber Wetschmerz de Nut, recounts having observed a distinct and deliberate undulation of the body, beginning with the shoulders and ending at the filament of the tail, which might well have been the origin of what is known today, in scientific circles, as the shimmy. The object seems to be the same, except that in the case of the newt, it is the male who is the active agent. In order to test the power of observation in the male during these maneuvers, I carefully removed the female, for whose benefit he was undulating, and put in her place, in slow succession, another but less charming female, a paperweight of bronze, shaped like a newt, and, finally, a common rubber eraser. From the distance at which the courtship was being carried on, the male, who was, it must be admitted, a bit near-sighted congenitally, was unable to detect the change in personnel, and continued, even in the presence of the rubber eraser, to gyrate and undulate in a most conscientious manner, still under the impression that he was making a conquest. At last, worn out by his exertions, and disgusted at the meagerness of the reaction on the eraser, he gave a low cry of rage and despair, and staggered to a nearby pan containing barley water, from which he proceeded to drink himself into a gross stupor. Thus, little creature, did your romance end, and who shall say that its ending was one whit less tragic than that of Camille? Not I, for one. In fact, the two cases are not at all analogous. And now that we have seen how wonderfully nature works in the fulfillment of her laws, even among her tiniest creatures, let us study for a minute a cross-section of the community life of the newt. It is a life full of all kinds of exciting adventure, from weaving nests to crawling about in the sun and catching insect larvae and crustaceans. The newt's day is practically never done, largely because the insect larvae multiply three million times as fast as the newt can possibly catch and eat them, and it takes the closest kind of community teamwork in the newt colony to get things anywhere near cleaned up by nightfall. It is early morning, and the workers are just appearing, hurrying to the old log which is to be the scene of their labors. What a scampering! What a bustle! Ah, little scamperers! Ah, little bustlers! How lucky you are, and how wise! You work long hours without pay, for the sheer love of working. An ideal existence, I'll tell the scientific world. Over here, on the right of the log, are the master draggers. Of all the newt workers, they are the most futile, which is high praise indeed. Come, let us look closer and see what it is that they are doing. The one in the lead is dragging a bit of gurry out from the water and up over the edge into the sunlight. Following him, in single file, come the rest of the master draggers. They are not dragging anything, but are sort of helping the leader by crowding against him and eating little pieces out of the filament of his tail. And now they have reached the top. The leader, by dint of much legwork, has succeeded in dragging his prize to the ridge of the log. The little workers, reaching the goal with their precious freight, are now giving it over to the master pushers, who have been waiting for them in the sun all this while. The master pusher's work is soon accomplished, for it consists simply in pushing the piece of gurry over the other side of the log until it falls with a splash into the water, where it is lost. This part of their day's task finished, the tiny toilers rest, clustered together in a group, waving their heads about from side to side, as who should say, There, that's done. And so it is done, my little master draggers, and my little master pushers, and well done, too. Would that my own work were as clean-cut and as satisfying. And so it goes, day in and day out, 
the busy army of newts go on making the world a better place in which to live. They have their little trials and tragedies, it is true, but they also have their fun, as anyone can tell by looking at a logful of sleeping newts on a hot summer day. And, after all, what more has life to offer? End of chapter 1 Recording by Melora